church this morning. Uh, I know it's a holiday weekend, so many of our friends and family are out traveling. For those of you here, good to have you with us. Um, we are going to just uh, just give you a little bit of service flow. We're going to go through uh, the rest of our worship set um, and then just be prepared that we actually changed. Uh, we tried to send our announcements via multiple means, but after the church service, we actually changed from our Labor Day party. It's going to be tomorrow at our residence, right, to actually uh, directly after service um, outside, assuming the weather holds. If it doesn't, that's okay. We've got space inside and we'll do a barbecue after service. So just be prepared. If your tummy's growling by the end of service, you're in luck. Good thing you came to church this morning, right? Anyway, let me open us again in a word of prayer. Um, before I do that, we are going to uh, just invite you as part of your time of praise and worship, right, to uh, give to the Lord, right? He's given so much to us. In fact, that's so much of what we're going to focus on this morning. So as part of our worship time, uh, should you feel led, should you call this church your home, uh, should you recognize that uh, you've been blessed beyond measure for eternity and also in this life, uh, we just invite you to give to the work that God's doing here at the church. Three ways to give. We're going to pass a plate. 
There's also, you can give online at thefalls.church. And lastly, there's a box in the back right outside the door where you can drop, you know, cash or checks or whatever. Um, it all spends the same way towards kingdom purposes. So let me uh, just open us in a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll just continue uh, singing our worship to the Lord. God, we thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, just thank you for this summer season uh, where uh, we just get to break it up and uh, enjoy the beauty of your creation outside. And as we just head into fall, God, we pray that um, so, many, so many of our lives just get really busy this time of year. So I just pray that as we've worked through our core values uh, in this series, Lord, that each of us individually and us corporately, Lord, we would remember that everything uh, starts and ends by just abiding in you. And apart from you, you we can do nothing. And as we just uh, focus on this last part of this series, which is embracing grace, uh, Lord, I pray that each of us would just uh, sense the, the, the miraculous nature of what you have given us that we could not do for ourselves this morning. And uh, Lord, we invite your presence here. May your name be exalted and lifted high. Uh, please take these offerings and these gifts and multiply them unto your purposes. We lift this all up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
and right now in the good times and bad you are on your throne you are God alone unchangeable unshakable unstoppable that's what you are unchangeable unshakable unstoppable that's what you are amen you are god alone from before time began you are on your throne, you are God alone. And right now in the good times and bad, you are on your throne and you are God alone. Just remembering that sometimes when it feels like he's not close, but he is. In our defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three and one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. And I believe in you, and I believe you rose again, and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, I believe in 
Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead, go ahead and have a seat, church. Thank you, Tyler and Inga, for leading us this morning. They do a great job. Tanner is out hunting, so I guess that's a good thing for him. That's exciting. Uh, no, it's good that he gets a break and gets to be out in nature and see what God created. Um, we've got a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, first of all, if, if you take out your bulletin, you can just look on the back. I already touched on this real quick, but our Labor Day party that was uh, scheduled for tomorrow is at our house. Um, this is um, maybe a couple inches taller than Tyler. Hold on. There we go. No, I wasn't an insult. It's just a fact. All right. Uh, so uh, after the service, we're going to get together, just have some time of food and fellowship. So hope you'll join us. Uh, we got hot dogs, hamburgers. And uh, for those who don't know, Jim made a cake. And uh, that is always a treat. Also, directly after service, or at the, at the end of service, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. So uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, so just uh, prepare your hearts for that. Um, next Sunday, we have a business meeting. So this is for those that call the Falls Church their home. We've gone through this series over the summer. And uh, really what we're looking at is, um, do you believe in, in basically in partnering with where God is leading this church? Right, And we've got a number of people that are on membership roles from five and ten years ago that we haven't seen in weeks or months or years. And we have other folks who come every single week, but we've never really given opportunity to join in you know, formal membership or partnership. So we're just going to extend that opportunity uh, next Sunday after the service. Uh, the service is actually going to be on. I'm just going to kind of share what I believe the, where the Lord's leading this church over the upcoming years uh, so that you have clarity um, of expectations. Um, also, we're going to just vote on the church budget. There's a number of improvements and renovations we want to do. So long story short, you're invited next week, if you call this your church home, to come have a voice kind of behind the scenes on how we're making decisions, what we're aiming towards, uh, because this is a, uh, a congregation-led church in the sense that what we want is uh, we want everyone to have input because it, it's your church as much as anybody's, right? We are the body of Christ. Uh, next is we actually, uh, Tony Anderson on, on Tuesday night, he leads a Bible study through the book of Acts. They just began. So I encourage you, if you're looking for a way to get involved, meet people, fellowship, study God's word. Uh, Tuesday nights, 6 p.m. here. I've sat in on uh, one or two studies that Tony has led. He does a fantastic job. He puts in the work, does the research. So I think it'll be really enriching for anyone that wants to come. Huh? And come hungry. Oh, come hungry. They, they will feed you, right? That's awesome. Uh, next is discipleship groups. So these are launching this upcoming week. Um, so we are grabbing, uh, we are getting in groups of anywhere from one, two, three, uh, and we are meeting together once a week to go through 18 weeks, basically one uh, module a week, just basically learning what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ, right? And then also, after going through this, everyone should be prepared if you ever, the Lord ever leads you into relationship with someone that they need discipling, you have a track you can run on and not feel overwhelmed by the process, right? So getting discipled while also becoming prepared to be a disciple maker, which is what Christ called us to in the Great Commission. Um, so if you are not in a group, 
or you are not signed up to be a disciple maker or be someone getting discipled, there's a communication card. Please let us know. We'd love to get you plugged in um, to that. And then uh, last thing we got here is a women's ministry event on September 16th. I believe that's a Saturday evening uh, from 6 to 8.30. We are having a special event just for women in the church. Now, it doesn't matter if you're 18 years old or you're 80 years old or anywhere in between, right? This is an event for uh, all women. And uh, Angie English is going to be leading it. We're going to have a time of worship, prayer, food, fellowship, um, and also, hopefully, the Lord bearing spiritual fruit through it. Come in expecting for that. Uh, men, we are also calling you that on that night, the women, will, many of them will need a, a reprieve from the children. So we're going to come together and we're going to help watch the kids as well as get a couple of the high schoolers um, so that we can give the women that gift of that evening. So with that being said, we're going to take a moment here, stand up, greet one another in a time of fellowship. We'll take four or five, six minutes somewhere in there, greet one another, each other, uh, ask how each other's week's been, uh, and then we will get going with our sermon for this morning.
good morning everybody how's everyone doing this morning great oh yeah the coffee the coffee has not kicked in yet that's okay it's one of those weekends right labor day weekend the rainy season is upon us i am not looking forward to the signs of winter coming just because i didn't like plowing my driveway that much so um but uh hey that's that's what idaho is right when you're in idaho be idahoan uh, my name is Sam, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I get to serve here at the Falls Church, and I get to uh, finish out one of um, our last messages in our core series. And it's really surrounded around a subject that I believe encapsulates the life of a believer. You know, and uh, one thing that we have to depend on so much, because it truly does give life to our years. You know, how many of you guys have ever, you guys remember your first job? Anyone here remember your first job? Now, l let's go back a little bit. Do you remember your first job and then they gave out this thing called a benefits package? Do you remember that? I remember uh, one of my first jobs graduating high school, there was this brother uh, in our church that had a aerospace company and they stamped, um, you know, aeronautical parts for different pieces of equipment. And I was so stoked. And he, I think he was from Arkansas, so he had a really deep, thick accent. Sammy boy, you wanna come work for me? Like that kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing nothing this summer that I just graduate and, you know, before I head off to college. And so I took it and it was my first full-time job. And, you know, they bring me on and, and I'm just like, I'm, you know, I feel like a big boy now. I'm walk, we're going up to this big plant, and there's these huge hammers, this, this factory going. They're, they're melting all these uh, metals because that's how they make the dyes to, to stamp it. And, you know, they're explaining the job to me, and I was just excited to be hired, and I'm, like, signing all my tax forms, which that's sad, you know, now I'm just thinking about it. But it's just, um, you know, I was so excited. This was not, you know, a retail job or anything like that. I was actually in a viable occupation. And then on top of being hired, there is this thing called a benefits package. And this is when benefits packages had like, you know, this thing that used to happen is like, I think it's called health insurance, you know? And uh, <laughs> yeah, I had health insurance, I had dental insurance, I even had life insurance. I didn't even know what that was, you know? And, um, and it was just like, it was a mind blow for like an 18 year old, right? And then on top of that, you know, I get this really nice like jacket that's embroidered and I got this hat that was really cool. I wish I still had it. And, um, and, on, and on top of that, I, I got like a company vehicle while I was at work and uh, they gave me my own gas card. And I was like, that is so rad. And what's even Better than that, you know, when you're 18 years old and then the, man, the, the owner of the company comes, he's like, hey, Sammy, I trust you. I know you won't abuse it, but feel free. If it stops taking too long and you want a snack, you use that gas card. You know, I don't want you spending money on my clock. And it was just awesome. Like, I was like, what? You know, <laughs> like it was a mind blown. And many of us, when we come to the Christian life, we feel that salvation is just it. However, salvation and coming to that place of being forgiven of our sins and entering into a relationship to, with a real holy God, I mean, that should just be it. That if, if, if we were to give anything at all from God, I mean, we should just be praising just for that. However, God has lavished benefits upon us. And it's not because we have earned it. We haven't done anything to earn God's favor at all. It says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So take every good that you have ever done and you pile it up and you stack it. You know, I walked in a mature citizen across the street and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I gave towards Salvation Army or whatever it is. And he says, you accumulate all your goodness in life and it's as menstrual rags in the corner of an office that everyone has to like obscure from that the, the equivalency to the righteousness of god your goodness doesn't match up and so god is not an ower to any man 
but he is a rewarder to those that are in him. And for many Christians, we do not dive into this benefits package. We don't take advantage. You know, I had a friend once that was like, dude, I didn't know this whole time. I actually had a scholarship to go back to school to gain training. And he used it and ended up going to get like advanced electrical degree. A and now he's loving life, like flourishing in his career. And he's just like, I didn't know this was part of the company package. And so hopefully today we can recognize the richness that's in Christ. We don't come to Christ for this. This is just something he lavishes on us because he is a gracious, merciful, loving God. You know, our purpose and mission statement here as a church is that we are a people that is pursuing Christ together. And that should be our mission. And in our core principles, we broke it down to the ABCDs of this church. And that is that we abide in Christ, that we believe in the gospel, that we contend for the faith, that we do life together as Jake talked about yesterday, and he's a great ambassador of that. And that we today are going to learn to embrace the grace that is given to us in Jesus. Amen. Would you guys just bow your heads with me and let's just open this up in a word of prayer. Father, we can't pray enough. There's been already so much commotion this morning to distract us and pull us away. We thank you for your grace, Lord, for fixing the sound system, the network issues that we've had. Father, even right now, the weather is clearing up outside. Lord, uh, thank you for providing for your church people to stand the gap and lead us in worship. Father, we thank you for the abundance of riches that you give us every day. We are all breathing. We are all in our right same minds. We are here present with loved ones. Lord, there are many who have not woken up to that this morning. Father, it says that we are to come with confidence to draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in the help in the time of need. Father, your word does not return void. You mean every single word. Father, you say to come to you with everything. Lord, what a benefit. The miracle, Father, is not that you, Lord, answer our prayers because you are a powerful, mighty God has created all things. Even right now, Father, we cannot deny the fact that we sense your presence among us. Now, that's not the miracle, Lord. The miracle is that you bother enough to hear us. What a loving God we have. And Father, we are so thankful for the grace that you have bestowed upon us. And we just ask right now that every word that goes forth, that we listen to it, not for knowledge's sake. This is not for a sense of enlightenment or to pursue some moralistic venture in our lives, Lord. This is us meeting face to face with the real God who has called us to live a life in him. Father, open our eyes to that now. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's message is simply embrace grace the word grace in the original greek is charis in its favor done freely without any claim or expectation of something in return how many of you guys have received the favor and then later on down the road there's a hook attached to it that you didn't even know mm. that's typically how humans operate hey, you know, I was really gracious to you like 10 years ago when I gave you such and such. And I was like, wait, I thought that was a gift. Well, remember that gift. You know, it's like this attachment of like, almost like take backsies, right? And, and, it, and it puts this animosity towards you and that giver because it's like, well, was it free or was it not? And the word here is really bold and really strong to the point that many fight against it. 
we have a community here that is entrenched in, I'm just going to say it, a false religion. We love them. They're our neighbors. But they do not comprehend the concept of biblical grace. Their concept is still man-centric, saying that, no, we still have to kind of somehow meet God halfway. But that's not the biblical characterization of grace. B.B. Warfield once said that grace is free, sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. Grace can only be grace because we don't deserve it. And later on, we'll find out what we do deserve, we don't get. And then on top of that, he gives us an extra measure of grace. And it's found in the New Testament over 150 times. As you read through the New Testament, it is the motive of redemption in the mind of God. And given apart from anything offered by us, God says, instead of like every other world system and religion, instead of every other relationship that you have ever encountered where it is like you meet me halfway, instead of that, instead of you building this platform of climbing this ladder to go and reach up to God, if I just clean myself up enough, if I just do enough things, God says, you can never reach me, but guess what? I will step down and extend my reach to you. That is grace. And that's what we're learning about today. If you have your Bibles, please turn them to me, uh, Romans chapter 5. And this will be the key verse that we'll be in, Romans chapter 5, and we're going to be in verses 6 through 10. We're going to see how this grace is extended to us. It says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die, um, scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But... God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So I want to break this down just a little bit. We see that in verse 8, but God shows. Another word in other translations is he demonstrates. The original language is broken down to sunetime. It's a personal characterization and characteristic of a joining together. It's a characteristic of one that says, I will gather together so that we may become friends that are trusting one another. Who is Christ joining together? And to whom does he demonstrate this kind of grace, this kind of action and characteristic towards? Is it those that have all their lives put together? The people living this, uh, you know, they got it all. You know, they got, you know, the 5.2 person family, the picket fence, right? Costco membership. <laughs> I'm almost there, but... No, it says this. It says that he demonstrates this first and foremost in verse 6 to the weak. To those that are still helpless. To those that are ungodly. Put it in this way. It's like if his, a, a terrorist came and took the life of a loved one you would be enraged in vengeance. And rightfully so. There's justice there. A life was taken. There was a great deep offense. Surely, grace is not measured to that guy. He needs to rot in the pit of hell. And many of us, like, 
that's what our flesh says, but it's beyond crazy to think that Christ even died for that person and extends grace to the most ungodly, undeserving person. Because if he can't extend it to him, then it's not grace. There is a merit-based system here, and God is not about that. And to the weak, nowhere in the Bible does it say, God only helps those that what? Helps themselves. You know, it's funny, I've heard that term so much just in my six months up here. And a lot of it is from people with this one secular, atheistic, almost like, you know, you just need to help yourself so they don't even acknowledge God. And then there's those that ascribe to a system of belief that do acknowledge God, but they still believe the same thing. God only helps those that help themselves, and, and that is contrary to Scripture. God says, I came for the weak. I came for the ungodly. I came for those that are helpless. That's who I extend my grace to. And then it says in verse 10, does he only hook up his homies, his friends, right? Like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it says here in verse 10, he gives it to who? For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Those who want nothing to do with him, he extends grace to them. Those that spit in his face, mock his people, mock the work on the cross, he still extends grace to them. Our God is good, amen? John writes about how Jesus brought grace and truth, and, and grace doesn't deny truth. It underscores it. You see D.L. Uh, D. Moody, great theologian of yesteryear, that's one of the Chuckism that I really love, is uh, grace means undeserved kindness. It is the gift of God to man the moment he sees he is unworthy of God's favor. And we see this drafted out in the book of John as, as John is always highlighting the love of the Father, the love of Jesus. We, we see this in, in, in the most famous football verse, right? We see it on, you know, uh, players, uh, they have it underneath their eye, they have it on their shirt, you see it in the stands. It used to be very popular, right? The guy with the rainbow haired color and you have John 3.16. But if we flesh out John 3, 16 and 18, is this, is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it doesn't stop there. There's more. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then it continues. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. I love that in 316 is that for whosoever, you're a whosoever, I'm a whosoever. The grace of God and the salvation of God is offered liberally to all. There is no special groupings of people that it's given to. However, it's given to you exclusively through Christ. Isn't that great that we all have access to this grace? But what does it require of us? First of all, it requires of us to humble ourselves knowing that we are unworthy of it. That is the first step. Is just like any other addiction problem or anything like that is you need to recognize that you have a problem. That you have tried to solve this equation yourself and you just keep getting more and more entrenched in whatever it is. And yet the grace of God is offering you a benefit that is an amazing benefit to have, and that is 
Our second point is we are to embrace the fact that we are forgiven. How many of you guys have had a situation when you know you have caused offense to somebody else and you wish there was just something you can do to make that thing right and it eats inside of you? Well, let's flip it around. Maybe there is a really hard, fast offense done towards you. Maybe someone stole your innocence as a child. You know, maybe you were ridiculed and rejected and, and put down. And that person never showed any sense of seeking forgiveness. And it was so hard because they basically were dumping weight on you. But yet as you carry that weight and being unforgiven, you kind of create this weight for life. And Jesus is saying, not only are you forgiven of that, you forgive those that have trans, you know, that has uh, transgressed against you. And I will take that weight. You put them on my hook. Be free to move. But know that you yourself are forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful to forgive. It's not the situation of like, if I come to God and, man, if he really knew what I was like, he knows. There's nothing that you are hiding from him. It's like the kid that got stuck, like Uriah, is notorious like that boy has an appetite takes it from his daddy but um he's always running in the pantry it doesn't matter whose house it is too you better watch out <laughs> especially you have the good stuff like the coiners and uh sometimes it's like it's so funny because he's evidently in there and he's trying to sneak like a snack or something and then we ask him raya what are you doing like we know what he's doing Nothing, you know, it's like, and then he just bolts out of the pantry <laughs> and like crumbs falling all over the place. And it's like, you know, and it's cute, but I mean, that's how we are before God. There's nothing that we're hiding. We just in, in ourselves feel like we have control of our lives and we can manage this PR of ourselves, but God sees right through that. There's nothing that you can hide from him. And yet, he is still faithful that if we confess our sin before him, that he will forgive you. Isn't that an amazing benefit to have? We see in Romans 8, 1 then, and it, and it goes even further, right? But there's more. There's always more with Christ. It says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's a little bit of condemnation, just a little bit. No, there is none. It says, um, you know, in the first part of this book in Romans, if you ever get a chance to just read through it, it's, it's like the constitution of our faith. And um, in this first part, it's an introduction to the uniqueness of the gospel message. We truly carry and bear a message that no one in this world has. You can explore Eastern mysticism and at the end of the day, it will not solve the problem of sin, and it will not solve the problem of your eternal destiny. If anything, their whole thing is just, just try really hard to not want anything, and you'll be happy, and eventually you'll just disappear in the universe. Like, it's this very, like, weird, never-ending cycle of constant, you know, how do I work myself out of this? Any other religion that you hear of, there's always steps. You need to do X, you need to do Y, and then maybe if it all checks out in this, you know, eternal spreadsheet, then maybe, and if you keep paying us money, then, you know, we'll put in a good word for you. And God's like, no, I'm going to give it to you all up front because I've already paid it. You just have to receive this free gift. And in the section that we're reading right now, chapter 8, is we are entering into an explanation of how the gospel transforms our lives. Paul is drawing the conclusion from his argument at the end of chapter 5, which we were just talking about. And he says that there is no more condemnation. This is a revolutionary, life-defining, relational truth 
of the gospel. That there is no more punishment that's going to be due on our behalf. There's no more anger of God towards us in our sin. We do not have to be like that person, you know, who has those expired tags, right? We were driving around with Texas tags, and, you know, I even got pulled over. They said that I didn't blink, use my blinker, but I think he was just checking out. He's like, dude, like, you got Texas license plate, you know? Um, but you're constantly like, oh, man, I'm riding dirty right now, you know? Like, <laughs> It's that constant, but that's how we are in our sin. We're constantly looking over our shoulder. And we are guilty. And we're just hoping that we don't get caught. And he says that there is no more punishment. There's no more anger towards us. All of that has been solved because Christ has solved that for us. The Christian is fully forgiven and delivered from the penalty of entering eternal death separated from God. And everyone's saying like, well, that doesn't sound bad. I'm going to go and I'm going to party with my friends. And it's like, well, hold on. Everything that we enjoy in this life is God, God is love. Jesus was love personified. Like he's literally love. What do you love? You love fellowship that's only found in God. You love trust. You love faithfulness, you love grace, you love mercy, you love gentleness, you love joy, you love happiness, that is only found in God. And what you are saying is, I don't want any of that. I do not receive that extension of grace to life in you. And God says, okay, then if you don't want to be with me on earth, then, you know, I don't want to force you to be with me. You go ahead and live your life as you want, and I will give you the desires of your heart, and that's to be completely separated from me, even into eternity. And you're removed from all those things that you thought were found in this world, and you're like, oh, no, they're only found in Christ. They're only found in God. What's on the other end of that? Anger, bitterness, condemnation, judgment, pain, suffering, and it just intensifies. What a wonderful gift that we have, that we are forgiven. We are no longer subject to that wrath of God and, and have to watch for him, and we are fully secured and united because of the work that he did on the cross. We don't have to depend on our work. And this just sounds so ridiculous, and it sounds ridiculous to a lot of people because it's like, well, then everyone's just going to do what they want. And it's kind of a theological conundrum that your thought almost have to go to that, like, the way that you think of grace is almost like, yeah, people could take advantage of this. But there's more. We are given grace so that we are free to live. Freedom is something that we as Americans love, amen? We celebrate it like no one's business. But who doesn't? You know, it, it's something that everyone craves. You know, like we want to be just financially free from all of our obligations and we can buy what we want, when we want, go where we want, do what we want, and no one can tell us a darn thing because we are self-sufficient. Or the freedom, like, as we understand, right, like it's just I get to do what I want whenever I want and no one can say anything. And then we echo the words of William Wallace, right? The, the greatest Braveheart scene, right? And he's out there fighting for the freedom of Ireland or Scot Scotland. I don't want to get that wrong, or, you know? Um, and he says, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our what? Freedom. He's just fighting. We're like, yeah, right? Like, let's go. However, our... our our conception of freedom is not real freedom. We're thinking of autonomy, not freedom. You know what we do with people that live out a life that they are unable to self-control? What do we do with those people that just go out and do what they want, when they want, how they want it? We put them in jail. 
they are a menace to society. If someone says, I want your spouse, or I want your, I'm going to just take them. I want your kids, I'm just going to take them. Is that the freedom that, that we desire to see in society? Oh, but there's limitations. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, the freedom that we're talking about is one that we have self-control, and that's only found in Christ. When you are free in Christ, you are free to live this life as it should be and not suffer the consequence of having guilt or condemnation put upon you. That is a benefit. We are given true freedom to live and express yourself however you want you know when married couples get together and they get to actually like be th they're intimate with their loved ones for the first time and they've been you know that place and I, i'm gonna go there but there's so much freedom in that and if we're pregnant amen like woo! and it's a big old party there's not this scare there's this big community let's go and like let's go there there's there's love, there's joy, there's, there's this empowerment because it's all set, it's like the fire that's set in the fireplace. But once we take that fire outside of its place and we try to be free with that fire anywhere else in the house, what does it do? It burns the house down. So God's saying, I want you to have pleasure. I want you to have joy, but I'm gonna show you how to actually use it, that you can fully embrace this life with joy with f fulfillment. So we are given freedom. In Galatians 5.1, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It says that for freedom Christ has set us free and stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. The liberty is our freedom from the tyranny of having to earn our own way to God or having to earn our own way to just... Uh, you know, we're constantly trying to rationalize our decisions. Or we're constantly in this place of just this guilt or why am I unable to produce things out of my life? My, my life? And it's freedom from the penalty and the power of eventually the presence of sin. It's having self-control. It's saying... I know I have the freedom to do this. However, this is going to cause more heartache in the long run than it is going to give me pleasure. And then we are free from the performance trap. We can get in that place of feeling like we're constantly having to earn our way to righteousness or our earn our way to the love of God. That God would love me more if I just did this. He'll bless me more if I just did X. So we think that we have to obtain a standard of righteousness for God for, and for others to accept us. How many people are tired of going to households of faith and everyone's just playing the performance trap? We got to paint ourselves as this perfected thing in order to be loved and accepted by those that are attending church. Where did we get that concept from? No, that's not what we're supposed to, that, that's not the life of Christ. That's, you know, Western Christianity. That's uh, social clubs. This isn't a social club. We are all here because we're in desperate need of a savior. We are all here because we are all beggars trying to find bread. And all of us who have found it just want to share, hey, this is where I found bread. We never have to sit here and, and God's like, you want to be free. You never have to wonder, am I good enough? Have I proven my worth? Is there something more that I can do to make you love me more? And God's like, I have, there's nothing you can do. I have loved you when you were a sinner and I love you the same today. And I will love you for eternity. And my people who follow me will hear my voice and have a heart and a spirit to do the same. You are loved. You are accepted. Come to Jesus. That's what he's giving you. And this leads us also away from the pretend game. 
That's a game that I hate. Always acting like, you know, we, we have it together or we're constantly fighting to keep the bad part down and suppress it. Like, I don't want anyone to know that I truly have an anger or, you know, uh, I don't want anyone to know that this is the way that I think. No, the, the, you know, we, we oppress things like the temper and the lust of our flesh or whatever it is. Now, those are things that by grace and Christ's freedom, Christ will continue to work out from us. That's why we come here. Christ is constantly in the cleaning business. That has nothing to do with your salvation, but a person that is truly submitted to Christ will have a heart that's longing to be restored to what Christ's likeness is. How do I handle my anger? How do I handle these thoughts? Jesus has wiped away our sins for all of our sins, our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. There is nothing more that you can do to make him love you more or less. In all of our mess, in ongoing struggle with the flesh, we have the unconditional love of the Father. There is nothing in me that my God hasn't already seen and hasn't already forgiven, and he promises to change that in me. And I am who he says I am. I'm not the opinions of somebody else. There's freedom in that. He is who he says he is. There's times where you don't even, you know, I love what um, Spurgeon says is, you don't have to defend God. He is a lion. You just got to open the cage, you know, open the gate, and the rest you just let him do. You know, as I'm dialoguing, as I'm contending for the faith, I, I keep that in mind. It's just like, my God will overcome any argument because he's real. He's not a made-up figment of my imagination. So he says who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. And this speaks to another benefit that we have is God's faithfulness. The faithfulness of God. We see um, my background, I, I've, I've done a lot of missions work around the uh, world. My, my wife has done extensive mission work. I mean, she's more hardcore than I am, that's what I said. But, um, but there's just something appealing to those that literally leave everything behind to reach an unreached people group. And so we, throughout the years, especially in seminary, have heard amazing stories, and I would highly recommend the story of Hudson Taylor as he went to minister to the people in China, the first missionary uh, to go to China. And this is what he says is, depend on it, speaking of the faithfulness of God. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Amen? For those who have ever taken a venture in faith, it's scary. You're probably giving the first two steps, but after that, it, it gets kind of cloudy sometimes. And I can attest that it, 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 it rattles nerves. Because when you're living in that venture, you are depending fully on the, the grace of God and his faithfulness and his provision on many levels. For many missionaries, it's a loneliness. It's this place of just like, I'm completely isolated to everything that I know, you know? Uh, and it's something that we have to reconcile and consider. We have a friend that might consider moving to India and uh, <laughs> this gentleman's like, okay, you really wanna think about it? Cause like, we don't have Starbucks out here. And it's like, ooh, I don't know, you know? And it's like, <laughs> really Starbucks? But like, that's like his concept of us Americans going over there to India. We just thought that was funny. Um, but yeah, it's leaving the comforts of home. However, in this endeavor of the relationship we have in Christ, we never have to feel like we're gonna be left hanging. We see it in 1 Corinthians 1, four through nine. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that 
every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you may lack, so you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This was a letter written during Paul's second, uh, second uh, missionary journey. You know, he's actually in Ephesus as he's dictating this letter, and he's thinking of the church in Corinth. And what is the church in Corinth, you know, dealing with? Well, one, of, one and foremost is the fact that there is a lot of secular thinking and ways of living in Corinth. Corinth was like saying Vegas or Los Angeles, you know, or... Um, you know, you think of New York, you think of these cities where it's a port town and, and you're bringing in all these different cultures and ideas and ideologies and there's all these, uh, you know, ways of seeking pleasure and, and money and whatever. And this is what the church in Corinth was established in. And to do, and then so the church that was there was compelled and they were kind of enticed to live life as the Corinthians. And Paul's heart broke for them. And he was, I mean, he's going to do some correcting in those letters. But he first extends a lot of grace. And it's the same grace that we're extending. Hey, I understand the culture that you're in and, you know, you're, you're living one way and another. You know, the, it's a messed up church. You know, you, you're going to church on Sunday and you're saying that's good enough. You know, we have a Bible in our hands, you know, on Sunday, and then the next we have a mistress, or they have some, you know, they're overindulging in wine, or whatever it is. And he's saying that I want you to break from the bondage of living this way that living for Christ is just a Sunday thing. Like, it's easy to dress up on Sunday and come to church and clap and sing and God bless you, and oh, that's so warm and fuzzy, but then Monday shows up, and then it's like, we're this whole completely different person. God's like, my grace is going to extend, and I'm going to be faithful to give you everything that you need to live in the world that you're in and be equipped to handle it. You're not going to be lacking in any giftings for that. And he says that in verse 5, he says, he has enriched. You know, that enriched means to, to make one wealthy, to have an abundance for spiritual access. You know, I couldn't help but think and wonder, like, I, as I traveled around IF, like, I, I did not realize how much you see this move towards mysticism and new age and this longing to... To, to dabble in crystals and potions and all that. You know, that's just a pretty cover-up of what it really is, and that is witchcraft and the occult. And what's attached to that, yeah, it's a form like, oh, I just feel so rejuvenated, like my mind's thinking different and all that. Yeah, because you are being groomed, and you are going to have, in a sense, dark forces attached to you, and it's going to suck the life out of you, literally. It's nothing but darkness. It will never give you life. It is, uh, it is an imitation of spirituality, but with no power, and the only power behind it is the bonding power. You are going to be in bondage. So much money is given to tarot cards and all this stuff, and why? Because people are seeking that. How many people do you meet? There's like, what's your sign? Oh, you must be a Leo. You must be that. Like, I get uh, like, I don't know what I am. I'm a child of God. That's all I know, man, is like, dude, I'm a wrecked up sinner with all these issues, and God came into my situation and saved me. And in him, I find the fullness, and I am enriched in every spiritual gift and access. I don't need any of that stuff. The Corinthians Christians had their strong points. They did have their strong points, but they had their weak points. And Paul praises God for their positive 
longing to want to be part of Christ, but then he gives them this thing, this, he expresses basically that God will take care of your weak points. Keep trusting in him. You don't have to hold on to the idols of this world that have no power. And Paul praises God for them. And then he, he says that not only that, he confirms to them that he will be faithful until the end. That Christ is fully sufficient. Christ is faithful. If there's anything you want to speak when we come to defending the faith against any other ideology, is this is that my Christ is sufficient. There's nothing that he lacks. There's nothing that he needs. We just sang about it. And yet he lavishes grace and forgiveness on us. He is an amazing God. And he is faithful to complete that work in us. And he tells us that. And he tells us because he calls us his friends. And that's our next benefit is that we are friends with God. We see this. How many of you guys have boarded a plane before? I know it's Idaho. We love them. I'm just kidding. It's just expensive to fly out here, so I would avoid it too. Um, but we have all gone on that flight, right? And, and the, 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 air, the flight attendants and all of them come up and they do the little thing, right? The, you know, like that kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, here we go. Like, what are we in the 60s? You know what I'm saying? Like, can we just like get this on the video? Let's go. And you have to admit, it just gets repetitive and it's just another box that the flight attendant has to check, the airline has to check in order to meet FFA regulations, and then everyone's like, bro, like, let's just get on with it. Let's get in the air, let's go. And even the flight attendant themselves, you can tell like, I just gotta check this box, I gotta be happy, let's just do it. This verse that we're about to read in John 15, 12 through seven, Jesus is giving some commandments, but he's not checking boxes. He's reiterating what he has been preaching throughout his ministry. Let's read it. John 15, 12 through 17. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends. And if you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For the, servant, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I have chosen you for it appointed you and that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I have commanded you, so that you will love one another. Once again, this is not a checklist, and Jesus is circling back, circle back, to what he has been communicating throughout his whole ministry, that the love, that he loves us, I mean, we hear that, and it's like a generic term. God loves you. Great guy, you know, whatever. But it's like, really? Yeah. It's a simple statement, but it's not simplistic. Like, a righteous God who formed and made you sees everything about you, and he loves you. And it's not a love that this love gives with conditions is that he loves you. And this is a farewell discourse. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to be betrayed by one of his closest friends. And yet Judas ate too. And he brings them together and he huddles them and he intensifies and he goes over again. He gives them a final briefing in a sense because these are the last words to his disciples that he, they, will, they will hear. And he says, this is my commandment. Jesus gave over 400 commandments in his ministry. However, the tone and the spirit that he gave it in was not that of the law. 
these were like, if you want to live in a way that's fruitful, if you want to live in a way that will give you abundance in life, you will do these things. And so he says greater love, he spelled it out that he was going to commit the greater love for us. And it says, you are my friends. And this really, there's like so much theological things going on in just these few verses that we could dissect forever. But what is going on is, this is a unique distinction that he never called Israel. He never called the nation of Israel friend. And that's crazy. Yet he's calling these disciples this ragtag group of, you know, fishermen and just rough guys around the edges. He draws them in close and he calls them friend. What does friendship involve? First and foremost, friendship involves a choice. You got to choose to want to be someone's friend, and God chose to be a friend of yours. Friendship involves some type of risk and be vulnerability. It, it, it involves a intentionality to genuinely care for them, to invest in their life, and to make them a priority. You act sometimes on their behalf. He thought of his disciples as friends. We are not a friend of God, the Father, by any right, except that we are friends of the Son. We are at peace with God entirely because of the work of the Son. And the Father receives the friends of the Son as his own. In verse 15, it says, but you are my friends. You're not slaves. You're not merely pupils or disciples, as in like how the rabbis would treat them. You know, that's why that you cho I chose you. That, that meant a lot because in those days, disciples would have to gather up money to sit under a, a teacher like Gamaliel or someone like that. It, it, there was like institutions back in the day. And you went and you chose and then you had to be kind of counted worthy to even receive teaching from this teacher. And Jesus is like, you guys didn't seek me. I came to you. I came to you at your work. I came to you at your family dinner. I came to you. I chose you. You didn't choose me. And that same brevity broadens out to everybody that is in Christ Jesus. We are not slaves. He doesn't treat us that way. I'm not just telling you what to do. Here's the friendship part is the fact that I'm telling you why I am doing it. You know, uh, sitting with friends that are, you know, like I worked with Ryan and he's a financial advisor uh, aside and there's stuff that I learn about Ryan that his clients will never learn because I'm his friend. There's a portion of his life that I'm entitled to because I am his friend and, and we have this relationship together. He doesn't treat us like the paid hands. He treats us as friends and he tells us exactly what his intentions are. We get to receive the knowledge and wisdom of Christ and that is something he only offers to his friends. In verse 16 through 17, he just boils it down to its simplest form. The mark of the believers is this, that you love one another. And we love one another because he first loved us. If I deny you that love, I am denying the very thing that I have received from Christ. You cannot give away something you have not first received. Have you received that love? And I'm talking about real love. The love that, as this verse says, lays down its life for another. That doesn't run away from the battle, but jumps in the trenches with you kind of love. That is the love that we are given. He says this with emphasis because the next statement that he gives after this section is what? If you read on, you're going to see, 
I need you to know that I have loved you. You are worthy. You have been approved by me. You should love one another. Hold to one another fast. Stay fast in this love because the world will hate you. And they hate you because they have hated me first. And no servant, we're back to servant and master, is greater than his teacher. God has given us complete access to his knowledge through his word, by the spirit. And we are grafted into our final benefit this beautiful family. First John 3, 1 through 2 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are the reason, so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared but we know that when, it, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. John 1, 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children and heirs of God. I know people were very enthralled, especially like the passing of royalty and all that. And what did it mean? Royalty passed, but then everybody's question in that kind of, you know, like let's call it the UK, was who's going to inherit the kingdom? Well, they're looking at all the children. Some of them are a mess, right? But uh, that was the question, like how is this pecking order going to work? Because who is going to inherit this? And he says, you are all children of God, and you will all in are co-heirs with Christ. Isn't that, he did all the work. He grasps us in and calls his friends and gives us his knowledge of what he's doing. And yet we get to be grafted into the family of God by none of our doing, but the grace of God himself. And you are placed in here today because of that. It was an overwhelming thought in verse one. Behold, what manner of love God has for us that we would, be adopted to him in joint error of him. That's found in John 14, 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. For now, um, for now on you do know him and have seen him. If you've seen me, you have seen the father. We belong to God. We are God's children. We are his possession. We have this identity now to be a family. In verse 2, but it doesn't stop there. We are given a promise of a future state. That we get to dwell with our brothers and sisters forever. When a believer passes away, it truly is a celebration of life. Because we know the assurity of where they are in eternity. There is no question about it. You've seen the life marked by the fruit that they have buried. You have seen the joy that have they displayed, the generosity, the grace, the way that they have passed down to legends. And so we sit here, we can sing worship songs. It's not the end. They are now fullness and glory because now they are face to face with their Savior. And they are given the promise to see Jesus himself face to face. The sight of Jesus will be the final act of grace you will receive. And for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now to the fullness. I want to close with this. Have any of you guys have heard of Kintsugi pottery art? Kintsugi Japanese pottery art is broken down into this kind of uh, art form. It's the meaning of kintsugi means to be joined with gold. And uh, Austin, I don't know if you have that slide. There it is. This is an example of it. And what it is, it's a specially formed pottery. And then the artisan and the craftsman takes it and it's basically broken into pieces, kind of like that picture on the left. And then each piece is then skillfully crafted by the craftsman 
and placed together, reconciling the piece to itself. However, the craftsman uses really expensive, pure gold. And this pure gold pieces and meshes the, everything together and, and restores the pottery. But now from going from an ordinary, broken, shattered piece of art, it is restored with purity, intentionality, thought, high resources, and it's elevated to this place of not everyday use, but now it's a piece of art to be shown to the world, given great exorbitant value. Some of these pieces are hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what the art is supposed to resemble is the fact that no, the, the broken pieces are not something to be ashamed of anymore. Because of the craftsmen that melted together, they're actually representations of it being put back together and given now full value regardless of its broken state. It's a beautiful picture, right? Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are the workmanship, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Tyler, would you come up? When Jesus went to the cross, he was making payment for our lives. Not for the good lives that are nice and well manicured and tailored. They're for the shattered ones, the ones that were rejected there were the broken pieces of bitterness and anger, loneliness, shame, guilt, unforgiveness. There were the shatterness of maybe an addiction or violence or lies or the inability to, to receive love or give love out. There was a brokenness, a running need to want to be repaired and when we kept running to things to numb the pain or to take our mind off of the reality of our soul and what we're at, all it did was exacerbate things. It created deeper holes, whether it was substance or, you know, multiple, you know, of, you know, you know like hookups or whatever, or people, false philosophies, running to mysticism, these things that have no power in themselves. We know that the hole is still inside of us. Yet in doing so, God came and he freely gave us the gift of salvation and he lavishes on us grace. The value that was not earned by performance, but it was his beautiful workmanship in your life. Bringing the pieces together instilling them with the grace of his purity and his holiness. Giving us tender love and kindness to every single piece, even if it was our own doing. And when we embrace that, he makes us into something new. And he places us in the seat of the righteous. And it had nothing to do with what we have done and it's everything that he has done, amen. That's the benefit of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes right now? For those who are in Christ, this is your benefits package. This is freely given to you, access it. We have gone through a series of how we do that. We're staying entrenched in his word. We're surrounding ourselves with his people and we're in prayer, constantly reflecting our lives that it's honoring to the Lord, but receiving his friendship and his goodness. We can taste and see his goodness. 
regardless of what this world sends our way. And for those of you who are not in Christ, he freely extends this to you today. There's no more waiting to be completed and full and reconciled, just like that piece of pottery that's shattered. God has given you and extended to you this grace. In his word, it says that we were all sinners. We were all broken. We have all these marks. And we have fallen short of the glory of God. But yet again, God demonstrated his own love towards us that even while we were in that state, he died for us. And the only thing that our works have ever accomplished is the wage of sin is death. But for those that are in Christ that confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And therefore, you stand now in that place with no more condemnation, for you are in Christ today. And it is for by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, but it is the gift of God. Would you receive his gift today if you are there right now I ask you to go into this prayer just to yourself is fine Jesus I have made a mess of my life I have tried my own way and I am tired I know that I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of my sin Thank you for your work on the cross and for raising to life. And I know that you are alive today. Would you make me alive in you and help me live this life to honor you and fill me with your spirit. Help me walk in your ways. Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender to you. I make you Lord, and I make you king of my life. I want to be with you in eternity. Help me live day to day. Thank you for your grace. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If that's a prayer that you guys pray today, I ask that you get together with myself, with Ryan, with Jake, with the leader from this church. And you let us know that confessing, we want to celebrate with you. We want to embrace you and welcome into the fold, into the family of God, because that is the promise that he has given you. And for those of you that walk in Christ, walk in his grace. And know and taste and see, as we're going to do right now in communion, that he is good. Amen? Let's sing. Austin, can you put this mic? There you go. <clears throat> hey, church, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. Hey, thank you, Sam, for that great word. <clears throat> uh, Jim, Dennis, can we get you to pass up the elements, please? <clears throat> um, I'm, gonna, I'm just actually, we, we've had a really bumpy week, guys. There's a lot been going on. And I know it's not just in my life or just Sam's life. It's, it's many people's lives. And uh, sometimes it's good to just come to the Lord's table. And uh, just, he, he says, do this in remembrance of me, right? Like, uh, and so I'm actually just going to recap a couple of the verses we went through as we just meditate on what the Lord has done for us, and we, and we partake in the Lord's Supper together. Um, in Romans chapter 5, verses uh, 6, beginning of verse 6, this is what it says. You guys can go ahead and pass that out to everybody, yeah. And just repeating, right? Paul says this to the, to the church in Rome. He says, for while we were what? We were still weak, right? At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for who? A righteous person, right? Though perhaps a good person, which there aren't many, we know that, right? Um, one would dare to die for that person. But God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John 15, we just saw this, the last discourse with the disciples. Jesus says what? He says, greater love has nobody than he who lays down his life for his friends. Right? 
So we're talking about laying down life. We're talking about um, dying. And this is represented. We see this in 1 Corinthians when Paul is uh, recapping the Lord's Supper to the, uh, the church of Corinth. He says, this is my body, right? He's quoting Jesus, which is for what? It's for you. So do this in remembrance of me. So church, if you just grab the bread, if you are a believer, if you are in Christ, if you are celebrating the benefits and embracing grace this morning, we just want to do this together. So if you would, if you would just grab, can I get one please? We just want to partake of the bread. And, and church, what we're doing here is we're doing exactly this. Christ died for those that were far from him, for those that were weak, for those that were unworthy, right? But for those that nevertheless he called friends and those for which he allowed his body to be broken on our behalf. Lord, we uh, just symbolically hold this bread in our hands, Lord, and we partake in obedience and we do this in remembrance of the great sacrifice that you died and your body was crushed and broken on our behalf. God, for that we celebrate um, the benefits of grace, that which we did not earn. We partake of the bread. And picking up in verse 9, Paul says, Since therefore we have now, what? We've been justified by our good works? No, we've been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath to come. All throughout the Old Testament, the thing that the people feared that frankly our culture doesn't have enough of is the wrath of God, right? And what the scriptures teach is that Christ's spilled blood covering us is what keeps God's wrath from coming upon us. In verse 10, it says, why we were enemies of God we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be not only be reconciled, but we shall be saved. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Lord, we come before you right now, and we just recognize it is by your shed blood that your wrath is turned away from us, and that we can walk in the benefits of your grace. Lord, so we do this in remembrance of you. Thank you for your shed blood, that it was yours and not our own, because ours would not put us in a right relationship with you. Ours would not redeem our life. Lord, ours would not bring us into friendship and into your family. But it is only your faithfulness that forgives our sins. And so, Lord, we embrace this grace by partaking of the fruit of the vine. Lord, we love you. Partake of the bread. Lord, as we just go into our last song here and we sing God of Wonders, may we just um, be overtaken with your majesty and may we just dwell on that. And Lord, we love you and we thank you for this service and time together in Christ's name. Amen. stand up and let's worship the Lord.
Lord of heaven and earth, early in the morning, I will celebrate the light as I stumble through the darkness, I will call your name by night, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Lord, reveal your heart to me. Lord, thank you so much for being a God of wonders beyond our galaxy, for being the all-powerful creator, Lord. We thank you so much that you sent your son down to save us, to free us from our bonds, Lord. Every time I think of your power, your grace, how you accepted us into your family, Lord, it just fills my heart with such joy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, church. Go. <laughs>
Bendición.